Welcome to Bibliostrand. You might notice I'm kind of in the dark. It knocked out power. And it's been now a little over 12 hours since we had power. It's back to being daytime. But since there's no power, the upstairs is getting hot. I'm down in the basement to keep as cool as possible. But those of you with basements, I'm sure you know, lighting is not always top notch. So I figured, let's take advantage. That's right, it's time for another Generate Your Own Adventure, wherein I take the choose and choose your own adventure and turn all of those duties over to random number generator. But I don't want to use up all of my phone's battery so I am not going to be using the Google random number generator. Instead, I'll be using good old fashioned dice. <laughs> Just one dice, actually, a die. I'm gonna set my planetarium up high. So now that I've got the perfect ambience, I might move my flashlight down closer to the book. Maybe. I'm also, you're going to have to just, there we go. You're just going to have to trust me on the dice and what number I get. Because <laughs> the way I've got my camera propped up, I'm not, I'm not taking it down, putting it up, taking it down, putting it up to show you the dice every time I roll. Ooh. So there's my dice. Odd numbers are going to be the first choice. Even numbers will be the second choice. And we'll see how far I get in space and beyond. It's only fair that you get a shot of this cool ceiling that I get to be under my What's our what's our premise? All of your numerous talents and much of your enormous intelligence. The wrong decision can end in despair, even death. But don't despair. At any time, you can go back and make another choice. Alter the path of your story and change its result. First, you must choose the planet of your birth. The choice you make will determine a major part of your future. Try to choose wisely. As they say in another galaxy, not too far from this one, Glebe Fogo. Good luck! You are born on a spaceship traveling between galaxies on a dangerous research mission. The crew of the spaceship includes people from five different galaxies. Your parents are not from the same galaxy, but both have features common to those found on planet Earth in the Milky Way. Because you have been born in deep space, you must choose the galaxy and planet of your citizenship. at 62 times the speed of light. You reach the Earth age of 18 years old in just three days and two hours. Now you must choose the planet Kenda in the galax galaxy of Fintum or the planet Croyd in the galaxy of Upas. The mission commander demands your decision. We got a picture of our, our birthplace spaceship. Kenda is three times the size of the planet Earth. The star that provides some of its life-giving force is huge but ancient. There is fear that it is losing its force. Kenda has a history filled with trouble. Croyd is in the galaxy Upas, far distant from the Milky Way galaxy. This galaxy has black holes and supernova stars. It has always been regarded as an uncertain region by observers and spaceship crews. It is a difficult area, and the black holes are uncharted and dangerous. Reports from previous space probes say that Croyd has had a dim and troubled past. The reports also prophesy a bright and exciting future. All right, so neither planet sounds like it's at the top of its game. All right, Kenda, odd. Croyd, even. 
Alright, Kenda it is. Kenda is visible on the galaxy scanner. Now that you have chosen, your parents announce that Kenda is your father's home. The crew of the spaceship carefully prepare a space pod for the journey. Seating yourself at the controls and positioning the programmed flight path, you disengage from the mothership and drift off into space. Once in space, you are propelled by gravity generators. Something is wrong. You look at the scanner and see a nebula that is not supposed to be on your course. Suddenly, the gases and particles of the nebula surround you. Your gravity generators and life support systems might fail. The radiation counter interrupts the silence of spaceflight with harsh bleeps and crackles a warning of dangerous radiation levels. All right. Odd, return to the num mothership. Even, trust my instinct and go ahead. Back to the ship. Mothership should be easy. You hit the navigation button and push the reverse command switch. But just at that moment, the lightning the lighting in the pod turns to the flashing green slash yellow warning color and all systems stop. Swirling gas and dust particles bathe the pod. You frantically hit restart buttons, but nothing happens. As suddenly as the gas came, it leaves. The warning lights turn off. The control panel blinks with energy, and the navigation control systems say go. The automatic SOS signal turns off, and you sit exhausted in front of the controls. If you decide to wait for help from the SOS call and then return to the mothership, odd number, decide to go on now that the mysterious nebula has vanished, even. All right. Even. Four. Your energy indicator has faded from full energy red light to one quarter level blue green light. Computer analysis warns you that all life support systems will stop in three hours, 16 minutes. There has been no response to your SOS. Through your radar scan, you realize that even if help does come, it will probably not reach you before all life support systems fail. You desperately wish that there were someone in the pod to share this with, but you are alone. You have decided to use what remaining energy there is to follow a light island message beaming from the black hole. Black holes in space are there because the mass of a star is so great that nothing can escape its gravity field. No light, no heat, no radio waves. Yet, mysteriously, a a light island, a phenomenon talked about and recorded by a rare group of intergalactic pilots, is clearly indicated coming from the region of the black hole. Some say that it is telepathic communication, or T-Web. You must go. You feel that the choices are either go, for, go toward the black hole and the light island, or drift in helplessness, waiting for a chance rescue ship. All right. Island, odd, drifting, even. Clean energy sources, you propel the craft toward the black hole. The closer you get, the more strange things happen to you. First, all the digital readouts on the command console reverse and spin back to zero readings. Your hair stands straight up as rigid as a wire brush. All light from your systems flow away in a stream and head toward the black hole. You feel all your blood rush to your hands and feet, and a frightening dizziness overcomes you. From one of the portholes, you see a pulsating velvet-like mass larger than the sky, or so it seems. There is a sharp, piercing cry. Go back! Before it is too late, go back now! You have absolutely no idea where this warning is coming from. Perhaps you can still turn back. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe there is enough energy reserved to escape the intense gravitational field of the black hole. The warning is not repeated, and you hesitate about what to do next. All right, if I roll odd, we're going to go on. If I roll even, we're going to try to reverse. All right, even. Hitting reverse engine and power output button fr buttons frantically, 
You feel the space pod tumble wildly as if out of control. A period of calm quickly followed by more tumbling surprises you. Now you are awake, wide awake. You glance at the control console to check the graph and the navigational computer. You realize that you are on the route to Kenda, that all is well, that you had simply passed into a programmed sleep period, which had produced the dreams of nebulae, showers, light islands, and black holes. On you go toward Kenda. The end. Aw, the trusty dice got me a good ending. <laughs> And a really fast good ending, too. This one's called Space and Beyond. And there are 42 possible endings. So if you want to know the other 41 endings, you got to go ahead and grab this book. That was really quick. So I think I'm going to see if we do another one. So following the space theme, this one is Hyperspace. Fifteen possible endings. This one will probably be a longer story. Think that they have some idea of the size of the universe, how long ago it came into existence, and when it might end. But no one can say whether ours is the only universe, or whether there is an infinite number of universes. If there is an infinite number, then some of them may be very much like our own. Professor Carl Zinka has devoted his life to finding out whether other universes exist outside our own time and space. You are about to be drawn into his quest. To do so, you will have to enter hyperspace. Hyperspace is so strange that it almost cannot be described in words. Some people believe that hyperspace is four-dimensional space. It may be even stranger than that. It may involve a world of five or six or seven or more dimensions. Certainly the laws of science may be different there. This makes it possible to travel to another universe in an instant instead of the many hundreds of years it would take to get there by traveling through the third dimension. One thing seems certain. Hyperspace is the only means by which we could reach another universe or something in another universe could reach us. What is it like to be in hyperspace? There are many possibilities, more than we can imagine. To get one idea of what it might be like, imagine that you are an ant and that you have spent your entire life inside a large balloon. The balloon is your entire universe. Suddenly, the balloon bursts. At that moment, you've entered hyperspace. Does anybody else have an image of a little ant? Just, ah. Are you ready to begin your adventure? I hope so, because it's about to begin. Is there here? Ever Professor Carl Zinka moved into your neighborhood You've been wanting to meet him. You've seen him a few times, out for a stroll, puffing on his white clay pipe. A strange-looking little man with a few stringy hairs on the sides of his head. You're cut in the shape of a triangle. People say he's a mathematical genius. You wonder what he does all day. One afternoon, you have a chance to find out, for you happen to be passing his house as he is returning from his walk. Come in, I'm glad to meet you, he says, when you introduce yourself. I've been so busy, I haven't had time to call on my neighbors. Shaking hands, you say, I'm glad to meet you too, Professor. I've been curious about your work. The Professor smiles. My work is not easy to describe. Only a few people can understand it. But wait, I'll be right back. The professor hurries into another room, almost tripping over his calico cap. A moment later, he reappears with a book. There is a twinkle in his eye as he hands it to you. Even if you don't understand higher mathematics, I think you'll find it interesting. Would you like to borrow it? You glance at the cover of the book. Its title is 
hyperspace. Take the book, thank him, and leave. Option two, stay and talk some more. All right, we're going to take the book and hit the road. Back at home, you prop yourself up with some cushions and start to read the book. Imagine that you are absolutely flat and that you live on a flat surface, you read. You can travel backward and forward and sideways, but never up and down. In fact, you never even know there is an up and down. Of course, in the real world, you can move backward and forward and up and down. But imagine still another way you could travel, a way we cannot even describe. If you could move in that way, you'd be in hyperspace. You look up for a moment and blink. This book is a little strange. You wonder whether it's worth reading on to the next page, or whether you should skip ahead a few pages and look for some real action. All right, next page odd, skip ahead even. I'm getting a lot of odds. All right. Ooh. Next page. The hyperspace are staggering, the book continues. Not only are there other dimensions that we cannot perceive, though they govern our destiny, but there are infinite numbers of universes, each of them as complex as our own, and traveling in hyperspace is the only way to reach them all. Strangest of all, these other universes do not always lie somewhere far with, beyond our own. They may exist around and within us. The most important scientific question of today is this. Can we enter hyperspace? Can we reach another universe? Just then the phone rings, and you put your book aside to answer it. Hello, I'm glad I caught you. The voice sounds like Professor Zinka's. Professor, is that you? Yes, I want to warn you not to come near my house. Something's gone wrong with my experiment. What happened? You ask. I thought I would be able to enter hyperspace. Instead, my molecular structure has started to break down. It's as if hyperspace has entered me. There's a click at the other end of the phone, leaving you surprised and uneasy. You wonder if you should go to the professor's house and see whether he's all right, or if you ought to call the police. If we run to the professor's house and knock on the door, it's going to be odd. Call the police, even. Odd again. I think it's because it's one of these foam dice that I'm getting all odds. One. You run to the professor's house and throw open the front door. Professor, you call. Are you all right? Hearing a muffled voice from within, you rush through the house and find the professor in his laboratory, working feverishly at his computer. He glances at you for an instant. Hyperspace is leaking in. I'm trying to block it, trying to plug the hole that separates us from an alien universe. Quick! Throw the green lever to the left of the door. There's our picture. Whoa. There is a terrible urgency in the professor's voice, and you lunge at the lever. Instantly, you are paralyzed by an electric charge that floods the room with quivering light. The two of you crumple to the floor. You feel as if every ounce of strength has been drained from your body. Finally, the burst of electricity dies away and the eerie light fades. Several minutes pass before the professor is able to pull himself together. Then he walks over and helps you to his feet. We stopped it! We sealed a hole to the hostile universe. If you hadn't come when you did, it would have been all over, not only for us, but for the Earth, and even for our universe. You hardly know what to believe. 
Is the professor a genius or is he crazy? I think I'd better get home now, you say, or I'll be late for dinner. I'm grateful for your help, the professor says. He shakes your hand again and again. More grateful than I can say. Someday I will repay you for what you've done. Several months go by without any sign of the professor. You often wonder where he is and what he's up to. You miss seeing him strolling along on his walk. On the other hand, on the other hand, his experiments were pretty scary. And in a way, you're glad he's gone. Still, you're delighted when a large package wrapped in heavy brown paper arrives in the mail. The return address reads, Professor Carl Zinka, Spica Laboratories, Khartoum, Alberta, Canada. Eagerly, you rip open the envelope pasted on the box. As you guessed, it's a letter from the professor. To my old young friend. I've settled here permanently and will not be returning to the United States for a long time, but I haven't forgotten to repay you for what you did. Inside this box is a small round bottle made of an unbreakable glass of my own design. The bottle has a cap that will open if you turn it 14 times. Its contents could be worth a fortune. Do you remember when we sealed off the hole and stopped the leakage of hyperspace into our universe? After you left, I realized that some hyperspace, specifically a gaseous substance, subject to the laws of gravity of another universe, had gotten into the laboratory. Using a polarizing diffractor, I was able to trap it in two bottles. I have kept one. The other is in the box you hold. If the bottle is open and hyperspace is allowed to mix with the air, the laws of gravity in the vicinity of the bottle will be radically altered. By holding on to the bottle, you could become weightless. You would rise above the treetops and drift across the countryside as if you were riding in a balloon. Gradually, the hyperspace would evaporate and you would drift to the ground. The bottle can only be used once. Since its effects may be dangerous, I suggest that you save it for a very special occasion. Sincerely, Professor Carl Zinka. You waste no time in opening the box and tossing layer after layer of plastic bubble wrap on the floor until you find the small, round bottle. See, to me, that's a cylindrical bottle. I wouldn't call it a round bottle, but okay. I digress. You stare at it for a long time, but of course there's not much to see. It's baffling. How can you be sure the bottle contains anything but air? When you're ready to use it, you may find that it's a fraud. Or, from what you know of Professor Zinka, it might be even more powerful than the letter says. Instead of lifting you gently over the treetops, it could carry you to the stratosphere, where you die from a lack of oxygen. What should you do with the bottle of hyperspace? All right, open it just to prove to yourself that there's really nothing in the bottle. Odd. Or... Decide to save it, even. Two, we got an even. You have your doubts about whether or not the bottle really contains hyperspace, but there's nothing to lose by saving it. Nearly six months have passed when you see a newspaper headline that almost knocks you off your feet. Professor's Discovery Fatal while a group of stunned scientists from the National Research Institute watched in horror, Professor Carl Zinka opened a bottle allegedly filled with hyperspace and was immediately flung into the stratosphere. He was tracked by radar, but contact was lost at the 80,000-foot level. It is not believed that he could have survived. Poor Professor. After reading the article, you take out your own bottle of hyperspace and gaze at it with new respect. Three days later, a group of scientists from the National Institute pay a call on you. The leader of the delegation, Dr. Wolstetter, tells you that Dr. Zinka's papers revealed that you own the only other bottle of hyperspace in existence. 
First of all, says Dr. Wolstetter, we must warn you not to open the bottle. You don't need to tell me, you reply. I'm not taking any chances. I didn't think you would, said Dr. Wolstetter. We would like to study the hyperspace in your bottle. It could be of enormous benefit to mankind. But the bottle must only be opened under carefully controlled laboratory conditions. We are authorized to pay you for it. How much? you ask. Dr. Wolsetter smiles. I'm afraid we can offer you only a tiny fraction of its true worth. Okay, but how much? One million dollars. One million dollars? That's a lot of money. You almost blurt out, I'll take it. But then you stop for a moment to wonder how much is a bottle of hyperspace worth? I'll think it over and let you know tomorrow, you answer. The scientists bid you good night, saying that they will call on you again in the morning. You have trouble sleeping that night, but you don't mind one bit. The end. So once again, the dice proves to be better at these books than I am. I was constantly getting the horrible endings in these things. Let a random number generator find the end for me. It seems I get the most safe and easy endings <laughs> and quick too. All right. So those are, I think, my only two space-themed ones. And I will be bidding you farewell.